You're goddamn right you are. And today we're getting into all the powers, all the one-liners, and the return of our favorite heroine. I'm Tyler with Joe Blow Horror, and today on Real Slashers, we're getting into A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, The Dream Warriors. Nine, ten, never, never, never sleep again. Where did you learn that rhyme? After the disappointment of Freddy's Revenge, Bob Shea and New Line Cinema were hoping to course correct. What better way to do that than to get Wes Craven back involved with the franchise? See, he did not want Nightmare on Elm Street to become a franchise and declined to return for the first sequel. But he returned to co-write the third film and intended for it to be the end of the series for good. This was actually around the same time that John Saxon had developed his script, How the Nightmare on Elm Street Began, which we actually covered on our What the Fuck Happened to This Unmade Horror Movie series nearly a year ago. So if you want to know more about that one, check out that video. Robert England himself had even developed a treatment called Freddy's Fun House, which would have followed Tina Gray's older sister. We would eventually see some of this script come to life in the pilot episode for Freddy's Nightmares. With his co-writer Bruce Wagner, Craven came up with the idea of a group of teens taking on Kruger. The logic behind it was that Freddy has just grown stronger in the years since, taking in soul after soul. So an individual would just no longer be powerful enough to take him on. There was a strong link with suicide, which the producers felt was a bit too taboo for the time, though some of this remained in the actual film. Eventually, Frank Darabont and Chuck Russell took over scripting duties and tailored the film into a more lighthearted and fun time, despite some of its darker elements. The concept of a man hunting down teens in their dreams is already such a cool idea that it's hard to imagine pushing it to a whole nother level. Whole nubber, nubber. But Dream Warriors does exactly that. Like most Elm Street films, we open on a nightmare. Kristen Parker is putting together a little arts and crafts project of old 1428 Elm. This opening is so simple yet tells us so much. We already know that Kristen has clearly been getting terrorized by Freddy. They pull the whole, you're actually still in a dream even though you're awake shtick, and it's beautifully done. Because of this suicide attempt, Kristen is sent by her mother to the Weston Hill Psychiatric Hospital. But little does Kristen know that the rest of the kids in her unit have also been seeing the same burned and disfigured man. These teens include... Joey, a mute boy who's a bit of a horn dog. Why, thank you. Kincaid, a tough guy from the streets. Well, let me see you come get a piece of me. Kruger, pussy! Jennifer, a delusional actress who puts cigarettes out on her arms. As soon as I get out of here, I'm going to Los Angeles to be an actress. Will, a wheelchair bound nerd. I am the wizard master. Taryn, a recovering drug addict. In my dreams, I'm beautiful. And Philip, a habitual sleepwalker. The fact that we all dreamt about this guy before we ever met doesn't seem to impress anybody. With all of these kids having such bad nightmares, the hospital brings in a dream expert. And look who it is, it's Nancy Thompson. She's made it her life mission to help weary sleepers and is on a drug called Hypnosil, which suppresses her nightmares. Unfortunately for Nancy, Kristen has the ability to bring people into her own dreams. And she does so with Nancy, bringing her face to face with Freddy for the first time since the events of the original. It's an incredible way to bring her back into the fold. And the look on Freddy's face when he realizes who it is, is just too good. What proceeds is Freddy slowly killing the Dream Warriors one by one until they band together to meet him on his own territory and take him out. You could argue that not all of the warriors get their time to shine, but there's a lot of them and we only have so much runtime. By the time they're able to make it to Freddy's dream lair, only Kincaid, Kristen, Nancy, and Joey remain. 
Oh, and we haven't even gotten into Craig Wasson's Neil Gordon character. He's a bit of a love interest for Nancy and is one of the doctors at Weston Hills. He fully believes Nancy when it comes to Kruger and goes on a mission with Nancy's father, Don, to bury Freddy's bones and get rid of him forever. In fact, despite both Mr. Thompson and Nancy being killed for their efforts, it's actually Dr. Gordon that ends up defeating Freddy. Which, given how important the Dream Warriors are to the plot, is really my only complaint. I would have preferred to have seen them take Freddy out. But oh well, Freddy has been defeated and everyone can finally sleep again. For now at least. This is where it takes us. We already covered this one in our video on the first Nightmare on Elm Street, but the Freddy Krueger character has changed a little bit since then. In the second sequel, Freddy is a little more of a quipster. It's back in the saddle again. He's actually more well lit as well, so we really get an up close and personal view of his burn scars. Otherwise, he's still the same fedora and red and green sweater wearing psychopath who takes way too much pleasure in killing the teens of Elm Street. Though I will say, he's getting more and more creative, really taking what these kids love and twisting it around before he kills them. This is also the movie where we're introduced to Freddy's mother, Amanda Krueger, and get a little more backstory on Freddy himself. See, it's revealed that a young girl was accidentally locked in a room with the most dangerous and criminally insane patients. They raped her hundreds of times. So I guess now you know why they call him the bastard son of a hundred maniacs. We're all friends, you and I. Remember? Let's get home. Now, my favorite scene and the one I desperately want to slice up is Philip's death. However, with YouTube being super stingy about gore lately, I wouldn't be able to show you just about anything, so instead let's focus on some of the other Dream Warrior deaths. First we have Taryn all decked out in her badass gear as she's walking through this back alley. Eventually Freddy shows up and has a bit of a temptation for Taryn. That's right, Taryn's former addiction is literally screaming out at her, her old track marks desperately pulsating for the needles. Such powerful imagery and just makes you feel absolutely terrible for Taryn as she succumbs to what she's been avoiding all this time. God, Freddy is such an asshole. Then we go to Will, who is no longer wheelchair bound. This gives him an absurd amount of confidence. He's a huge Dungeons and Dragons nerd, so it's no surprise that his dream persona is the Wizard Master. He even gets this nifty little cape. But just because you think you're a hero doesn't mean you are. Will is able to use his dream powers, but unfortunately for him, he's just not strong enough. This is it, Jennifer. Your big break in TV. Fuck the front time, bitch. A Nightmare on Elm Street 3 Dream Warriors released on February 27, 1987 and brought in nearly $9 million on its opening weekend. It would eventually end its run with $44.7 million domestically. This was a massive success and ended up being New Line's biggest hit of the year. Needless to say, their gamble on the franchise most certainly paid off. The film was even well received, earning a 71% fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Dream Warriors has always been a standout in the series and provides some of the best Freddy moments ever. Then there's the theme song written and performed by Dokken. The song utilizes elements of the movie for its lyrics and is easily one of the best horror themes to ever exist. Robert England even appeared as Freddy for the song's music video, which even utilized some footage from the film. Nightmare on Elm Street 3 would be followed up with five sequels and a versus film with Jason Voorhees. The idea of bringing back the Dream Warriors has been floated around several times, as there hasn't really been a formidable group going against Freddy since this film. Which is really too bad, because the concept is actually very interesting. 
and is mostly abandoned in later sequels. Sure, we get Alice, but she's solo most of the time, despite having some pretty cool dream powers. What do you think of Dream Warriors? What would you like to see us cover on the next Real Slashers? Comment down below and we'll see you in the next one.